Okay, so, welcome back, yes. There is no voice in the lecture on YouTube. Yeah, the voice on lecture on YouTube is a, is a screw up. It's because the guitar, Buzz Aldrin is going for it, has two backs. One back is so you can actually hear something, the other back is so you can take it down and Let's get on with this preamble pop quiz from last week. We all know that we're going to have to ask 
or answer some questions that we've prepared. So, what's the significance of Tom's Diner in your everyday life? Let's put them all on. Why is Tom's Diner significant in the user experience? What properties of Tom's Diner makes it so significant? Why does it represent good science? So the first part is, why is Tom Diner significant in your everyday life? Everybody's been on Wikipedia then. Could you, could you even bother to type into Google Tom's Diner? That's going to have to change. Yes. Plenty of criticism of music or not. Well, audio, that's right. Plenty of criticism of audio. Google's going to work. Okay, yes. Oh, 
Hans Brandenburg. Carl Hans Brandenburg, right, is uh, mainly, mainly um, famous for inventing the compression aspect of entropy. And then one day, he was wandering along down the corridor of entropy, and he heard some music. And this music was uh, Tom's uh, diner, a cappella version, made with electronic techniques, I should say. And he went, Jesus, MP3, my compression is never going to be able to handle that. This is going to break everything. And he quickly grabbed it, grabbed the song, went back and did the test. And his expectation was, I'm going to break MP3 compression by testing it on this song. And only when he was secure that it didn't break MP3 compression and that the sound degradation was not noticeable, um, was he happy that this was okay. But his original point was, I want to break my own compression. Because if I can break it with a really tough song, I know that it's going to be good for all the ones that are less tough to compress than this. Okay? That's good science. He didn't think, oh well, I tell you what, this is going to make a really, this is going to be a really good case for showing how my compression is brilliant. And then use that, because that's easy to do. You can, you can pile on, in science, you can pile on many, many tests that confirm the hypothesis, but it only takes one to break it. So what you try to do is break it. Okay? That's the point. And that's what he was trying to do. And doing this is an aspect of good science. He was trying to break his, sorry, his own compression algorithm. Um, and that's what he wanted to do, because he was a good scientist. Yeah? Or is he a good scientist? Not very much. Okay. So that's the first part. So are you all happy with why this an excellent aspect of the science. Okay. We're going to have to start to talk a little bit more. Discussion point. Let's talk about understanding, scoping, and finding the user experience to serve the approach. So you've all read it and you've all submitted your reports, I presume. Unless nobody's been, been to me with this the hamster seat shaking incident or a horrible chainsaw accident. Everybody's got all their limbs that they had last week on, as far as I can tell. So that's good. Um, so what do we think of that? I'm going to keep standing here. I've got all day. Yeah. You know, somebody needs to you know, drive up the talk or not be here. It's as simple as that. Yes. So I, I think the, the biggest problem to make is that the research has a bigger experience in seeing a different way from country to restaurants. Yeah. So I'm not interested in finding a unified experience <coughs> Yes. You touched on it a little bit then. 
but I thought it was interesting to say that you know, whether these experiences are social or a personal thing, because I think that it's quite a social thing, because if you get a group of people and say, oh, this is rubbish, then you're more likely to think that that's rubbish as well. Yeah, that's very good. So this kind of break, this kind of distinction between whether it's a social experience, whether it's a personal experience. Obviously, social experiences nowadays are far more um, available. So you know, you can have remote social experiences with Facebook and all sorts of social networking and stuff, where you can be influenced to think something, even if you're not kind of in a geographically located group. But that also is important for um, any things like focus groups or any kind of uh, methodologies you're going to implement, it, implement because it might not be that you're getting a personal view, you might be getting a social view, and that social view is, can be often um, led by individuals who are more dominant, as we were saying last week, and that means that you, know, you might not get a realistic view. So, yeah. Pop psychology. Yeah, pop psychology in a lot of ways, that's true. But the actual, um, the actual what is user experience is actually quite interesting because when you've got get on that. Okay, more. Yes. Uh, I think the paper also touched on the limitations of user experience, the trial experience is a wider topic, so we cannot expect to influence like majorly the whole brand to take things on user experience. Yeah, so we can't so it's just one point we can't expect to influence everything based on this. Okay. Okay, more thoughts? Yes. So subjectivity is an interesting point here as well. And also subjectivity through time spans. If you look at the time span of work, then you can see that our subjectivity <coughs> in particular to something changes based on you know based on time, based on the time we're exposed to it, but it also changes based on um, lots of other aspects such as uh, you know, if you like whether we're morning people or, or afternoon people or evening people and when we're doing this kind of evaluation. Are we doing it at a time when we are happy about you know when we're most um, engaged if you like. So you know how how does it change through the day? So anybody anybody else want to say about it? Who likes the paper? Nobody likes the paper. One person likes the paper. Who didn't like did three few people didn't like the paper? Who did like the paper? Oh more people didn't like the paper you're terribly terribly incorrect. That's, that's your exploit, yeah. So I mean, I, um, it's not as quantitative, even though it's trying to be with regard to the statistical analysis, because we're trying to get some quantity there. But it's mostly, you know, a lot of the stuff we're doing in UX now is quantitative. So the answers that you get are muddy. They're not. They're not going <coughs> forward. I also think that qualitative answers, sorry, quantitative answers, um, they make us feel good, but they don't represent the whole story. They probably aren't correct most of the time, in UX work anyway. I mean, if you've got large, large sets of people who are going to, I mean, here we've got a, what, a sample of 250 or so, something like that. Well, that's not enough. I mean, generally, if, you want, if you're trying to represent all UX people everywhere, that's, you know, or all HCI people everywhere, that's a really, that's quite a small sample size to be actually, and, and they're all self-selected because they're all going to this conference that, that, they, that, they, that they question people at. So, yeah, I mean, it just seems like quantity is we can hang our hat on quantity, but we pro often can't in the next one. Can ask the market? Yes, put your hands up because we can ask you a question. Why is it? Yes, you can ask it, yes. A little bit more you know, what's about methodology. Yeah. So yeah. The authors themselves will just pick the statements. Yeah. They will just use to rank. Yeah. Which can leave open fire. It's more likely that they will pick statements. The people that they already have some agreement with. Yes. And they're not asking whether that's the response to the comments. They're not going to take those comments and say, well, 80% of the top 20 said this comment, which we missed out, this definition is missing. Yeah. They just have people around the statements they've given, which are the ones that they already more likely agree with. This suggests that they're really just trying to back up their own opinion rather than look for a good one. Okay, so that's good. So, generally, methodological concerns here that, you know, certainly what is UX? 
there's a set of statements that are already defined by the authors, and so you have to rank them, and so that means that you can only rank the ones that that are presented to you, right? You can't just say, well, here's my own version, and uh, it's not these. Of course, there's programmatic reasons for doing all this, and you'll find that in, in real new experience there are programmatic reasons, because if you allow people to type every single uh, permutation of a, of a definition or anything that they like, you'll get, if you've got 100 people, you get 100 slightly different answers. And that means how do you, how do you get anything from that? How do you get that there's an overall um, consensus? Or is there even in a consensus? The only way to do it in some ways is to maybe do a literature search of what people have already mentioned, part to those points where of what and where people have mentioned what they think the X is and they think uh, you know, books and papers, and then put those together. Now on the All About UX website, they have a set of definitions. They have like 30 definitions that they pulled from uh, literature. But you're right that presenting only a, a, a small set of those means that they've made a choice for some, for some reason. Anything else? Who else didn't like it? See, I'm doing some science here. I'm thinking the people who don't like it. So if you do it, you'll put your hands up, I'll be I'm silent. Um, let's see if you can over here. You know. Seem to ask, or at least they're not coming around. Okay. 
So the human computer interactions remain that was invented about 30 to 40 years ago, whereby the idea that, uh, is that we're interested in how humans interact with computers, how humans interface with computers, how once we've created computerized tools, we as humans are affected by those tools in ways we didn't imagine. Just like um, that's what, in some ways, who's heard of web science? No? Big research domain? Big domain? Web science? No? Tim Burns Lee, lots of, you know, 30 million pounds? Okay, so web science is this domain whereby uh, the web has uh, developed in ways that wasn't originally intended because all of you, all these people who use the web, your influence on it has become more like a social science. Okay? It becomes a kind of approximate for the social interaction and psychological and cognitive interaction too. So not for web science. So this is, a, this is one of the reasons why HCI was created, because we're interested in how people are shaped by the computer and devices and tools that they make, and how their interactions can make those tools and devices better. So that's the first thing. Um, it coalesced disparate fields in psychology, sociology, social science, and computer science. So if you look at these fields, they're mostly, they're mostly um, about quantity. So they're mostly about measuring things in quantity. So psychology, you're measuring things in laboratory experiments. It's metric science. Okay? So we'll see in psychology, we've got very rigorous computer science. Uh, sorry, very rigorous experimental work going on. In social science and sociology, in bit less than sociology, in social science, Social science is there because it's measuring lots and lots of data really from populations. Now this is mainly, um, mainly in very very widely distributed <coughs> questionnaire form. So we'll see, we'll get to that as well later on. But this is mainly in questionnaire form. So you've got these social the social science, and you've got computer science obviously because this is what people are trying to do here. Okay, the idea is that. In the old days, you'd create something, you'd have an idea, you'd create it, you'd look at the creation, how can we create it, how can we build it, what's the research idea? We then make the application, we build the application, and then we test whether the application is what we expect it to do. This testing phase used to be all about debugging, okay? So the testing phase used to be all about debugging, it used to be all about um, uh, sort of uh, black box, white box testing, that kind of thing, okay? But now, it's far more, far more about whether user experience is right, whether users are able to interact with work, products, and find it engaging, and find it interesting. Previously, it used to be just about how quickly could you do something? Okay? What was the metric site? What can you do? Create a metric from. So who's in the FITS law? FITS law. FITS law? You've not heard of FITS law? one part of the screen from one part of the screen to the next part of the screen. So you can see how you should logically group components in the GUI or on the screen. Okay? So FITS law defines this. There are variations for FITS laws for pointing and updates, but FITS law is the first one that was created. Okay? It's pretty simple to write. So this is one of these human computer interaction metricizable points, right? Where should you how can you group things together? Because this will maximize speed, and we can measure things like speed, okay? Comprehension. We can measure things like comprehension. We can measure things like information retention, okay? We can measure things like interface retention, okay? But it's very difficult to measure engagement. It's very difficult to measure things like, um, did this interface make you happy? Did it make you feel unsafe? Are you did it make you feel secure? Those are very difficult to measure because they rely on surveys. You know, rely on surveys. And the thing that you'll see in a bit is that surveys, you know, people lie. So they're not as reliable as people would like them would like would like to be. Okay. So UX is really practical ACI with benefits. So the benefits are that you get all this quality, you get things that are intangible. It's not just the qualitative stuff, because you've already got that in a lot of ways from anthropology, from questionnaire approaches, if you're looking for open questions, 
talks often about intangible things. How are you feeling? Okay. Do you, does this make you feel good? Does it make you feel excited? What's your engagement with this thing? Okay. Even at even if you're not using it. You know, the reason why Max forgot was that people became engaged with Max, his brand. They became they loved the system, but then they became, they became, became a bit fabulous for it. Okay, so you know, that's why Max forgot. Huh? Being different. The thing's different, that's right. The thing different is the is the is the thing they're going for. It seems like when it comes to iPads or or at least iPhones now, it's think the same. <laughs> so but there we go. Okay. So the thing that UX says is that users are not silent. So previously we build something, we we have an idea we build it and test it, but that's it. UX says users aren't silent. UX says that we need to include users not from the time that we're testing it, but from before we start testing it. Okay? They are supposed to take some kind of design role um, in, the, in the thing that we're building, because otherwise, what are you building it for? Okay. Now, we'll see there's some differences in this later on, because there's this thing called autobiographical design, which means that you design it yourself and hope everybody else is like you. Okay? But often they aren't. And I've got to say, how many of you are um, software engineer computer science based as opposed to if you come from some other discipline outside of uh, computer science? So some people are from across the university. So how many people are computer science students? That should be a meeting. I'm inside of the computer science. Okay. Alright, so yes, so that's the thing. Computer science scientists, sadly, are not very good indicators of autobiographical design because we're quite egocentric. Okay? We're quite, you know, only people who like to do lots of control commands that, you know, I know lots of computer scientists who look at Emacs, don't use GUI because they just want to be on the keyboard. Okay? Quicker, but quite egocentric. There's lots of lots of times when you're building systems and lots of systems that are built in this autobiographical are unusable because they rely on a certain not transferable mental chemistry like cognition. So we're not the best people as computer scientists to, do to actually design these things. We're best to either, if you've got a good idea, start with that good idea about, about how something can be done, but then start asking people, not your friends who are computer scientists, but people in the real world who aren't computer scientists, okay? random people in the street. Okay? They don't understand what the hell we're talking about. I, I think you want to go and be talking about it. You'll see. So you start mentioning stuff like you know, what's an application, what's an activity. But what, oh, what, what are those, that, 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 what did you press on the phone? That iPhone on the phone, there's no iPhone. Okay, lots of time. So you're going to have to change your language. So these things mean that you're maybe not best suited. Okay. Systems conform to users, not users conform to systems. That's why if you try to get iPhones and these things, you know, an iPhone or an Android phone or these kind of devices are dictated by the size of their manual. In the old days, in the old days, you know, I am old, very, very old. In the old days, we used to have a system called Lotus 163, which is a spreadsheet system, and it came with a set of manuals in binders, and the manuals in binders were five manuals each to tell you how to use it. That was how you communicate. Now we don't want to. We don't want anything. You know. Generally, if it's not intuitive to use, if we aren't able to use the system and the system adapts to us, then there's a problem. Okay. So now the quality of software is often represented by the size of the manual. The smaller the better. If it's a small manual, the better it is because you don't have. Systems become less of a concern with generalizability. <coughs> For instance, you've got lots of different kinds of apps on your mobile phone, and all those different apps do a specific job. But there's very few apps on mobile phones, on tablets, for personal use now, where you have something that's as big as, say, uh, Microsoft Office, where, where you've got something that's huge. Okay? Even writing tools have changed so that they just do one thing well, and you don't get distracted, which is write. Okay, and they try to cut down on the quote 
chopped around on the, on the machinery about. So you can just concentrate on the process, okay, and think about everything else afterwards. So systems are becoming less concerned with generalizability and they can be more concerned with being specific to a person, okay, and to a context of use. We're also becoming slightly less concerned with measurables and tangibles. So some things can't be measured very well, but it's intangible. People just think, yeah, that's good, I like it. What's this on? Yeah, I think it's quite nice. Right? It's far more informal. Okay? And that's because we don't know about engagement. It's very difficult to measure engagement unless we harness people. You know, we're going to look at later on about how to use. Uh, <coughs> Smell 
the pheromones to be for interaction for purposes, so you know, not beyond, beyond the science fiction. Okay, it's a unification of the scientific and the romantic. So, reader of Seven and the Last No Cycle Maintenance will soon get to see that, that that's what it's about. That's one of the things that we're about in Seven and the Last No Cycle Maintenance. It's about the interaction of quality and quantity, the interaction of science and romance. Okay, so this is what we're into scientific work in HCI and romantic, i.e., what do people feel, what do they, what, you know, what's their emotional output. Okay. Objectivity blended into subjectivity. So what we're saying is we're not throwing away all objective work. And we're not saying we're only going for subjective stuff. We're blending the two together. And we're trying to measure, um, we're trying to think about measuring the intangibles too, as I've said. So galvanic response, skin response, the um, pupil dilation and that kind of thing. Okay. So the UX landscape. Differences among countries and race of the might have seen this actually. Did you get yours, get your your um, thing about UX country differences based on um, based on your reading the paper or based on the slides and reading the paper? Good, very good. The only one you need to read, yeah. Yeah. Differences among countries of residence. Okay. So what does this say? small sample based on countries. So there's what, 193 countries or more maybe now? But Erin, we've got four. In Erin, yeah, you're right, they're quite helpful. These countries here are self-selecting because that, sometimes that's all you can do, right? You know, in, if you're doing a questionnaire or you're doing a survey or you're doing any kind of experiment, sometimes you can only do a self-selecting sample because you can't create a random sample because it's too, it's pragmatically impossible. Okay, or it's pragmatically not possible. Okay, so that's a problem as well. So we can't take everything that this paper says as being true. What we can take is that it's a good starting point, maybe, that it gets us going at least into a discussion to have about what the X is. And so this is why the country differences is very, very telling. Okay, 23 statements about UX. So this is interesting for this paper because it defines it defines um, UX by statements that people agree or disagree with. It doesn't in this case, it, well it does try to talk about a definition as we've, as we've talked about, but in this point it, it's not too worried about that, it's bothered about what do we think, what do US professionals think is important. So what they're saying is to, you know, really up till here is what we think it might be. So it's fleeting, more stable aspects of a person's internal state. 
So that's the top one, but that's one of the things we're talking about. Needs, motivations. Okay, so it's difficult to understand needs and motivations quantitatively. Okay. UX occurs in and is dependent on the context in which the artifact is experienced. So if you're experiencing a uh, phone in an Apple store, you're much more likely to buy it than you are buying a phone in uh, Phones for You. That doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Because it's the experience, you're buying the experience, too. Okay. You're being charged more because it's a quality product, so if you feel good about that, you're actually going to put some money down and teach you a you know, quality item. It's a soft piece of kit. But also, you go going into a nice, bright store with geniuses to help you because you're all geniuses. Who's oh, genius? Oh, okay, sideline here, I can watch you, you're biased. Okay, god damn those Apple people, they're crap. That's what I say. So, Android, that's the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so that means that these things are important. If you're going to sell product, if you're going to sell some technology, if you're going to test people, okay, you've got to think, am I testing them? You know, if you ask a load of people into the BBC to do a test, they're hyped up. Okay, they're loving it. Um, because hey, they're going to the BBC. You know, that's a good thing. <coughs> if you're asking them to come into the School of Computer Science, yeah, yeah, it's just a skanky old School of Computer Science, isn't it? It's not so great at the BBC down at uh, Media City. So their expectation is higher. You get, even though you test the same software, you get better results at the BBC than you do at the uh, University of Manchester because their expectation is different. And the same is true for um, if you go to Google. You go to Google, hey, brilliant, people sliding down poles to get to their dinner, break and food everywhere, and loads of you know, sodas and all this kind of stuff all over the place. It's awesome at Google. Uh, and so people are hyped up. They look pretty hyped. They go there, I'm going to have a good time testing today, and now I'm going to get my dinner. And push that's it. And talk to these Googlers who control the world. Who's work, anybody working for Google? We've got that form, I mean, no, come on, you need something like additional, additional technology put you on. <laughs> okay, so prior exposure to an artifact shapes subsequent user experience. So if you've had a bad experience with an artifact, you're gonna have the second one you do, even if even if it's been improved, you're gonna think it's worse than it is. So that's that's the difference for when you're talking about experiments, because you might want to think about this when you're thinking about experimental setup, which we'll get to, but when you're going to have, well, it's called between subjects. Actually, it's participants is the politically correct term, and it's the proper term we should all be using. But the old language is between subjects or within subjects products. Okay. So this kind of work, you've got to decide whether you want fresh people to evaluate your work if you make improvements, because they'll be affected by their negative experience of the first time they've done it. So they might be lower, lower score. Um, user centered design. So we're going to get to user centered design, but what they're saying is that users must be the center of the UX, of the preventing user experience. Um, UX can change even after a person stopped inter interacting with the artifact. So once you've stopped interacting with it, you walk away, then are you feeling good about it? Oh, that's good. You know, I feel good about that. So you can like it more after you finish using it because you're feeling you know, much better about it. Yeah. And then uh, UX is based on how a person perceives and character the characteristics of an artifact, but not on the characteristics per se. Okay? So perception is key. This is what people think is. How they perceive it as opposed to how it actually is. The thing with our measurable Quantitative HCI is that it's all about the characteristics per se. Think about user experiences, it's all about the perceptions of the characteristics really. Okay, so that's the difference. Okay, let's move across from this one. Um, we've already talked about time spans and how things can change. So we've got anticipated user experience, momentary, episodic, and communicative. Communicative is quite interesting because it depends, you know, you might like something more the more you return to it. Okay, you might like it less the more you return to it. That's quite interesting also. So let's look at that as well in conscious time. So we've got UX picks definitions. So we've got lots of different kinds of single word definitions, if you like, not really definitions. 
um, but that's how we describe it. So we've got things like, how is the definition, and then we've got characteristics, positive and negative. Positive, comprehension, easy to understand, simple, clear, concise, okay? So ambiguous, circular, hard to sell, non-scientific is things that people don't like, they call negative. Potential user that, users, um, identify all the important factors to be studied. So that's something that's really necessary. What are all the identifying these first, not just identifying at the end? Okay. Enable general public to understand user experience. That's something that is also necessary for these de for these uh, definitions of user experience. Okay. It's layered. This is interesting. Layered. So it's a layered approach. So it's not just one thing. There's a lot of layers in the definition. That's what they're looking to say. Okay. So therefore, you can you can appeal to general public at one level, but then come down to a more technical, hard-nosed sort of uh, definition, or part of definition for technical people. Okay, so we've got all these in the UX, we've got all these in the UX landscape. So the first one is, all aspects of user interaction, I think we've got these, I hope we've got these people around, in the next or printed, or whatever. Oh, which reminds me, printed, here's an aside, I thought of this at the start. Um, if you're going to print your notes, you need to come up and fill out the signing sheet, which uh, will be, ooh, this is my paper. There we are. Put in the signing sheet to the interval, and you can get an extra set of print credits. Okay, so only people in the room for this week and next week, if you put your name on the sheet, you can have another 200 print credits just to print the notes, okay? But I need your name, your ID, and all that, you know, your, your library card number or student number, whatever it is, and then only at the only at this lecture and the next lecture, and then you'll get your print, like, print credits increased. You want to print, as opposed to be electronic and advanced. Okay. Um, so, the first one is, all aspects of end users' interaction with, its, with the company. Like, that's the first sentence. V2, a consequence of the user's internal state, their predispositions, their expectations, characteristics. V3, the entire set of affects. So what do we think that mean, means? Affects. What's that new word for? Closely 
close it together so all aspects of end user interaction with the company, its services and products, blah, 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 through the entire set of affects. So this entire set of affects seems to also mirror the two, it's just different languages, which is quite, quite nicely. Now, we've then got D4, which everybody hates. Everybody hates the value derived from the functions with products or services and supporting cast in the context of use. Okay? So that goes to me, that goes to sort of goes from um, a product service first first sentence or first part into something that seems like you know acting lovers at the end of the last part. Okay? So we're looking at the cast of the con cast of the context of the use. And then we've got D5, which is uh, 36. So it's kind of there, it's damned by faint praise, as we say. Um, the quality of experience first has any attraction to the D5. Now, let's have a look at these. So let's have a look who voted for what. So generally, lots of people like D2. Okay? And we can see that the people who liked it are mainly academics. Academics like, like me liked it more. Why do you think that? Companies like D1, people from corporate industry like D1 method. The clue is in the first line, all aspects of energy is not the company. It's one of the only ones that mention companies, it's the only one that talks in an industrial corporate way. Okay, so it's kind of obvious they're going to like this one. Yeah, it's bias. You're right. Okay, then we've got D3. So what about D3? Well, again, these two look kind of similar. Okay, there's different levels in the actual uh, in the actual uh, scope, in the, in, the, in the levels that these uh, these are, in the frequency. But still, you know, they're representing a similar kind of trend. So you can see that academics like this a lot more, but than, than these industrial guys. But still, the industrial guys liked it less, just like they liked it too. Okay? Nobody liked it for pretty much everybody. Um, and then you've got D5, which is near, near the end there. So in general, it seems that, that I'm likely, because I'm an academic, to be teaching you these things. <coughs> That's my predisposition, you can imagine. And actually, if, I was, if this was an industrial training course, I might be teaching you this definition. And of course, the definitions affect the, what we're going to cover. So I'm building the course around this so that you are able to go into industry and say, I can give you those bills. So therefore, you should always take this into account that what I'm teaching you, there's lots more to understand than that. And the definitions might change or vary on a, you know, on a yearly basis even. And they change and vary based on what background you're coming from. Okay, so my view. Here's my view. This is my egocentric view, just so you all know what it is at the start of the course. You can all disagree with me at the end of, by the end of the course and we can have a bit of a... You know, week 20 punch up or the next 20 punch up, perfectly good. Um, or you can just, you know, <coughs> in and say how right I was that my definition, that the definition is important and awesome. Okay. So, I believe that the US is primarily about practice and application. It's an umbrella term for a multitude of specialisms. That's, this is, so the, the reason why I'm telling you this is because this is how I'm going to teach the course. Okay, so you should be aware that that's how I'm going to teach the course. You might be able to reassemble the things in the course differently to it fits your view of what you think uh, these experiences is because you disagree with me and that's okay. You're able to. Yeah, that's part of it. Okay. It's a phenomenon that in that it exists that it is a, that it exists and is observable. That UX is a second to further study if the narrow definition of UX is mainly concerned with emotion and cases. Okay. Which is why I think it's true. Okay. And then the phenomenon collects people have to trust their needs into a wider human factors than that. I do not believe that this that UX is a primary research dimension, but rather that UX is a practical application of a particular, particular combination of tools and techniques. Okay? So there's lots of discussion about UX in the research and then maybe that only matters if you're a researcher or you work at Google or Microsoft Research, those kind of things. But it matters in the way that I teach you. And the UX is a layer, okay? So it's a layer in the software artifact for its development, but like, look, rather describe the software artifact in a holistic way. Okay, so that's that, that's that bit. So, 
I've already changed my definition once already to the CMS. But I'm saying the unique experience is when relative used to start all the factors that contribute to the quality of experience that person has when interacting with a specific software artifact or system. Okay. It focuses on the practice of user centered design, um, creation, and testing. So the users are there all the time. Whereby the outcomes can be qualitatively evaluated using small numbers of users. Okay. So I think there's got to be an evaluation. You can't just say, well, yeah, this is good because you know, I wish we connect to it. There's got to be an evaluation. But it doesn't have to only be a quantity. Okay, it can be quality. Okay. Now, 10 minutes, copy time. Back in 10 minutes. Um, we're back at 10 past, let's say nine minutes. Um, for the next part. If you've got any questions about this first part, then of course you don't want to see now. Obviously, if you don't want to film the camera, then look at the camera. Also, uh,